pick up an introductory psychology textbook and somewhere within it you will find a discussion of behaviorism that includes reference to a black box. This black box refers to the mistaken belief that behavioral analysis treats a person as if he or she was an empty black box. Behaviorists, it is said, are not interested in what is happening inside a person. My favorite quotation on this issue is by Spinelli, who says, though fast in quantity, the great majority of behavioral findings tell us little of worth about ourselves. Having denied the importance of subjective data, their findings appear limited, alien, even soulless. Now this is quite a damning indictment of a whole scientific discipline, if it was true. Unfortunately, many students in traditional psychology courses will not be taught how to challenge this perception because their teachers will also have been taught similar fallacies in their training in the UK, including the notion that a person is viewed as a blank slate with no role for genetics in the explanation of behaviour. When I first came across this notion of a person being treated as an empty black box, I couldn't reconcile this depiction of behaviourism with what I knew to be the focus of B.F. Skinner's writings. Also, when I looked at what was happening in applied behaviour analysis, it didn't make sense. Here was a science that was having so many successes in helping people change problem behaviour that surely to goodness it could not have happened if what was inside a person was irrelevant in some dismissive way. I imagined that at the end of a successful intervention there must have been a smiling face behind each of the dots scientists used in their shorthand to monitor the effectiveness of what they were doing with the person. The dots I referred to are the data points on a graph. As part of this presentation, I would like you to also look at two tutorials I have placed on YouTube. Icons for these tutorials are on the bottom left of this opening screen. Here's a picture of me inside a Skinner box with one of my undergraduate classes. This image represents the controlled environment within which the teaching episode occurs. Now, if I had the right resources, I should be able to bring these students to the point where they know how to address misrepresentation of behaviour analysis when they come across it. Unfortunately, much of the resources I can think about include some very complex essays on the philosophy of science and papers and books written by Skinner. It is difficult to find specific teaching gambits that would help me teach about private events in the classroom. And when I say teach, I don't just mean telling students what Skinner said or telling them about what others have written on what Skinner said. No, when I say teach, I refer to a teaching gambit that involves students in reflective exercises that help them embrace many of the questions that arise in the area of self-observation. Given that such gambits are hard to come by, it is not surprising that some students leave their class with views that perpetuate the myths about behavioural analysis. So let's get right into this. Here we see a particular kind of self-observation. Here I am looking at myself in a mirror. Now if I were to believe the nonsense about behaviourism in black boxes, I would surely be forced to concede that I consider the person I'm observing to be a black box. That is, I would be forced to argue that I'm not interested in what is happening inside the person being observed. In this slide, we see that there are two different perspectives. On the left, I am self-aware. From the perspective of others, however, as represented by the image in the mirror, the essence of my self-observation cannot be appreciated. What makes this scenario all the more interesting is the fact that I am a behavior analyst, and as such I am skilled in both perspectives. However, if I were to believe in the myths about behavior analysis, then I should not be able to engage with both of these perspectives.
This image adds another layer for consideration. At first sight, we see here the same statement being both sensible and nonsense. It seems acceptable for me on the left to say, I have a brain. However, the image of me in the mirror causes a problem. How can a brain say, I have a brain? That would imply there are two brains. Furthermore, each brain within a brain could say the same thing. Thus, we would have an infinite number of brains all claiming to have a brain. How do we deal with this statement? But I certainly need to trust. The short answer is that for now it is too early in this tutorial to comment. Instead, I will leave you hanging with an interesting conundrum, one that introduces you to what is called epistemology, theory of knowledge. Many of the issues raised so far involve an understanding of how everyday language creates problems for a science of behaviour. An everyday word used when explaining behaviour is the word intelligence. We say someone can do something because they are intelligent. We also say someone behaves in a certain way because of their personality. Another common word is the word trait. These words and others usually make reference to something inside a person to explain their behaviour. In fact, it is the operation of cognitive processes that is said to be the explanation for what is observed. In this image, I have simulated the operation of cognitive processes. Now, here is a crucial question. How can reference to what's happening inside be used as an explanation for what is happening inside? The processes don't explain the processes. It just doesn't make sense. Strangely though, this simple point is what fuels much of the misrepresentation of behaviour analysis. When we say the processes don't explain the processes, it doesn't mean we are uninterested in what is happening inside. On the contrary, we are simply saying that it is a fundamental mistake to view internal processes as independent variables. Because you still have to explain what made the processes happen, they are properly categorised as dependent variables. The independent variables responsible for changes inside a person will be found in the environment. The root of the problem is the way that ordinary language interferes with the scientific analysis of the relation between dependent and independent variables. To make this point a little more personal, let this image represent you as the scientist. This animation represents the scientist being observed through a microscope. It was created to remind you that even the behaviour of scientists can be viewed from another perspective. Science, after all, is something that people do. This means that conclusions about the nature of the world around us should embrace the two perspectives we looked at earlier in the images with the mirror. When studying behaviour, every observation is of an organism with a genetic history and an environmental history. In a simple experiment, you can change the context of the observation and monitor what happens. Not surprisingly, change occurs. This simple observation is the basis for how a natural science studies behaviour.
Changes in the whole person involve all that is happening inside, for example thoughts, feelings, awareness, etc., along with changes that can be observed by others. Collectively, these changes are categorized as dependent variables. On the other side of the coin are the independent variables. These are the environmental events that are manipulated by the experimenter so as to produce the changes in the dependent variables. The search for order in nature is a search for the relation between independent and dependent variables, what are called functional relations. These relations are normally summarized in graphical form with dimensions of the dependent variables indicated on the vertical axis and the circumstances of the observations detailed on the horizontal axis. Let's look at an example of a functional relation. Here are some data taken in a school. On the y-axis on the left, you see a measure of the number of times disruptive behaviour occurred during a class of about 20 children. On the x-axis at the bottom, you see the number of sessions in which this disruptive behaviour was measured. These data show that there are some serious problems in this classroom. This second set of data shows an entirely different profile for disruptive behaviours. It is basically non-existent. It turns out that these data are not taken from two different groups of children. They are taken from the same children in different conditions of a study. The data were produced for an undergraduate dissertation. The goal of the study was to produce the second set of data but without using any coercion. We used what is called a good behaviour game. When I designed this presentation, I wanted to show what happens when conclusions about data are based on traditional terms normally used within psychology. What intrigues me and what worries me at the same time are the views of the teachers who supervised this class. How come the problem behaviour was allowed to continue for so long? How were the teachers explaining the behaviour in their class? Presumably, their explanation for the behaviour is somehow related to the decisions that were made to manage it. But their management was unsuccessful. Then it took a behaviour analyst, one of those superficial guys who treat people like black boxes, to remove the problems in the class. Somebody's perspective has problems. I think it is clear that whatever the teachers were taught in their training, it didn't empower them with the skills necessary to bypass the limitations of traditional ways of thinking about the explanation of behaviour. So much for observing the behaviour of others. What about self-observation? In the next few slides, we will look at an exchange between two perspectives, one in which the observer has his eyes open and the other in which the same observer has his eyes closed. Today, we will be examining the topic of private events. Skinner taught us to think of a person as the focal point of a number of influences. We can't study the private events of another person. What we can do though is to arrange contingencies and examine their effects on behaviour. Excuse me, but Skinner also said, we should not be surprised that the more we know about the behaviour of others, the better we understand ourselves. So why are you talking about this guy's private events when you can't even see them?
You can't see my thoughts, but I can. If I decide to count how often a thought or a feeling happens, I know I did that. But you can't see me make this decision. Can you rely on yourself to be accurate when identifying this thought again or others like it so you can count them? You certainly can't do it for me. So what happens if I try? There it is again. One. Do you believe me? Three times. Believing is not the issue. I can't see any of the three discrete events you're reporting. I know what you can't do. But I also know what I can do. But what you're doing is not science. Are you telling me that once a trained scientist closes his eyes and gives attention to what he sees so he can count it, he's not behaving as a scientist? There is more to science than counting. The search for functional relations is what is important. Of course functional relations are central to a science of behaviour. How else would I make sense of the data I collect? The thing is, you don't know how to collect the data. I do. If others can't see the data you refer to, then how can I be sure you have correctly identified a functional relation? Are you adopting the position of a methodological behaviourist? No, I'm asking a practical question. But if you insist that the data collected be shared with others before it can be useful for a science, then you're sailing close to the edge of methodological behaviourism. I can show you a simple way to change someone, but you will not be able to collect data on their private events. The person will be in a better position than you to see the functional relation. All you can do is talk about it. He or she will have the data. I see from my analysis that you have ignored issues to do with dualism. You talk of the person and the data as if they were two separate entities. I am aware of this issue, but I had presumed you would have excused my expression, just as I might excuse your reference to you and your analysis. When you report on a finding, your behaviour is under the discriminative control of the functional relation between data observed and the environmental contingencies that produce the data. When I report on a finding, my behaviour is under the discriminative control of the functional relation between data observed and the environmental contingencies that produce the data. Because you can't see the data I observe, are you suggesting that I stop observing? Surely it can't be a mistake to continue with the procedures our parents used when they taught us labels for private events. We could do so under the guidance of a science of behaviour. Now we come to a simple exercise in the study of private behaviours that addresses many of the issues touched on in that conversation between the two observers. To set the scene, this image represents the process of living. All living entities change over time and when behavioural analysts study this process of change, they do so using a natural science perspective. From this perspective, the purpose of scientific inquiry is to show what changes occur under what conditions. When you make observations of the process of change, you are in effect taking snapshots of the unfolding of the behavioural stream. We can represent this stream by a film strip. A simple exercise is to ask someone to think about the future. Of course, when they engage in this behaviour, we can categorise it as behaviour occurring in the present. At this point, the term futuring is entirely appropriate.
the same analysis also can be used when we ask someone to think about the past. It is behaviour occurring in the present and therefore we can call it pasting. And of course, only a participant actively involved in doing this exercise can see the difference between pasting and futuring. On the other hand though, the fact that both behaviours can be viewed as behaviours occurring in the present means there are lessons here also for the participant. To fully appreciate the implications of this exercise, you are advised to consult the original manuscript available in an iBook on iTunes. Here is the book on iTunes and the reference to an abbreviated version of the exercise. Now we come to a personal example of how a behavioural analyst can engage in self-observation using the insights obtained from his science. Here is a picture of one of my dogs. Her name is Lily and she is in Newfoundland. This photo was taken when I first got her as a pup and this was her first experience of snow. Here she is a few years later, fully mature. In this slide, we see her coming out of a rock pool on the coast where I live in Northern Ireland. What's interesting for me in this slide is that we had to work really hard to get her used to water. Her breed normally takes to water like the proverbial duck, but Lily had issues with water and initially she was very resistant to swimming, but we got there in the end with her. Another trip to the coast and another swimming session. Lily played a major part in my children's enjoyment of the beach. Sadly though, she died very recently at the ripe old age of 10. This is about the limits for her breed and she is sorely missed. Now that she is gone though, and the memory of her is fresh in my mind, I thought it would be useful for teaching to take advantage of the things I observe when I miss her. My analysis of the changes that happened to me after Lily died, should incorporate the lessons from the behavioural stream covered previously. I can represent my changes over time like this. The line coming out of the head represents the private world as it changes over time. As we shall see, the kinds of changes I observe in relation to the loss of Lily can now be mapped onto this image. So, what do I observe? Well, I'll keep it simple and talk about a few things that would be expected after losing an animal that had been part of the family for 10 years. When I come home from work, Lily is no longer there to greet me at the gate. Interestingly, I am not constantly aware of expecting to see her, but her absence at the gate reminds me of what I used to see. At dinner time, we used to put leftover food into a bucket for her, but now we don't do that. Each dinner time though, we are conscious of not putting food into a bucket. In the evenings when I go out, I expect to see her at the door. I expect to see her coming from around the corner of the house once the car starts. I expect to see her any time I hear the chickens fighting. I expect to see her when I look out of my bedroom window. I expect to see her when I walk in the garden and on so many other occasions. You could call it conditioned seeing, in the sense that I feel her presence even though she is not there. Now a science of behaviour will tell me that each of those occasions when I expect to see her will have a natural frequency of occurrence. These occasions will also have an intensity, duration and latency associated with them. There are changes happening and nobody but me can see them. Yet, there is order in what is happening and it is a kind of bereavement process. As we shall see, the kinds of changes I observe in relation to the loss of Lolly can now be mapped onto this image.
Importantly though, all of my thoughts and memories and images are from my history with her. In effect, I engage in episodes of pasting behaviour. And when this happens, it is the environmental context that controls it. In this image, I have represented each of the environmental contexts by the little clock images beneath each image of Lily. What I also notice is a big difference in the frequency of my conditioned seeing when I'm away from home. There are no cues to sustain it to the same extent. Now, behaviour analysis is about getting the balance right between two different perspectives. The world is viewed from outside and the world is viewed from inside. When early philosophers addressed similar issues, they talked about the constructions of the mind on the occasion of sense, as Chomsky noted. In many respects, this is what this presentation has been about. My everyday language, though, doesn't usually connect the constructions of my mind with the context of sense that produce the internal dialogue or self-observations. Physicist and philosopher Alan Watts captured the issue beautifully when he said that the skin does not separate you from the world, it connects you to it. To conclude, when your teacher describes behavioural analysis as a discipline that promotes the notion that people are black boxes, let him or her deal with their misrepresentation by exploring the issues in this presentation. It should be an interesting eye-opener for them. Note also that this is only a, a brief introduction to some of the topics that are involved in the study of private events. We've only scratched the surface. So let's consider this as lesson one.